my goodness, I'm telling yeah. you, the marvelous majesty, the miracle working power, the supernatural administrative ability of God is beyond belief. Yeah, yeah. It is just overwhelming how majestic God's strategies are and how they work completely uh, to our benefit as, as those that he loves and those that he came to redeem. And it's just a marvelous thing, marvelous thing for the Lord to work in our life. I, I want to read a passage. This is out of John 19. However, most of what I share today will be out of Luke 24. But in John 19, and all the Gospels have the, the last statements, uh, the last, well, it don't, they don't necessarily have the last statement, but they do have the fact that when Jesus made that statement, that he gave up his spirit. Yeah. Uh, he released it. He, he, uh, he let it go. He, he dismisses his spirit. Uh, signifying the fact that no one took the life from Jesus, but that he gave it up. He gave it up. He gave it up. I'm going to teach you a Greek word today, and uh, that way you can impress all your friends You know, when you go home from church because they'll say, well, you just go to one of those little shopping center churches that's not very deep. And, you know, you know. So when they say that, I'm going to give you some Greek to put on them, all right? When, you, when they say that, you just say, I'm going to teach you this Greek word, and then when they say it, you just say it to them. And say, there you go, buddy. There you go. Now, it doesn't matter whether you know what it means. They're not going to know what it means anyway, so it doesn't matter. But we're going we're to put it on them. We're going to put it on them, all right? Here's John 19. Uh, John, of course, you know, was the only disciple that was at the cross. All, the, none of the other disciples were there. Matthew wasn't there. Mark wasn't there. Luke's not even a disciple. So uh, Luke is a companion of the Apostle Paul. But yet the Holy Spirit penned the gospel through him. Nothing, nothing negative about that. He's called the beloved physician, by the way. And uh, he's a wonderful man of God. And the Holy Spirit used him to pen one of the gospels. But he wasn't even a disciple. So the gospels all record the last uh, words, sayings, actions of Jesus when he was on the cross. And John, the only one that was an eyewitness to exactly what Jesus said on the cross, because he was there along with Jesus' mother. And, uh, and John says, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, you know, they first tried to give him this uh, uh, analgesic kind of stuff, this vinegar, this gall to drink, uh, so it would anesthetize him a little bit and take away some of his pain, is what it was about. And he rejected that. He didn't want any of that. Didn't want anything to take away his pain. He wanted to feel every ounce of pain and every bit of suffering that he could possibly feel because he was suffering for us. Look at his neighbor and say, that was for you, by the way. That was for you, by the way. He had no sin. You know, he had no guilt. He had no shame. It wasn't for him that he did this. It was for you and me that he did this. And John said, when he received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, which is a shout of victory, by the way. It is finished is victorious <laughs> words from Jesus. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So when the word of God spoke the last words, his last words, he then gave up his spirit and gave his life to his father. He gave it up. He gave it up. About the time, a few hours later, that Jesus has uh, been taken off of the cross, he's been put in the tomb for his three-day and three-night uh, respite, uh, his three-day, three-night uh, prize fight, uh, his three-day, three-night confrontation with the prince of darkness and death. By the way, he meets death in the octagon, for some of you folks that get on into that, and and he, he, he chokes death out, and, and dope, death taps three times, and, and, and only Jesus walks out of the octagon. But that's, that's, that, look, say, that's power. But that's power. That's strong. Yeah, that's strong. And then Jesus takes on the devil himself and whips him and throws him around, takes the keys away from him, and uh, I will get to that at the end. And uh, that's strong, man. I mean, that's a powerful thing, but... What I, want to, what I want to use today is, is, a, is a story in the Bible that is, I, I would not say that it's not well known because mo many people have heard of the story of these two disciples that after the third day and, and, 
well, I'll, I'll have to deal with that too. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's puzzling why they would leave so quickly. You know, uh, everything that Jesus said while he was here on earth was that one of these days I'm going to die. They're going to put me on a cross and I'm going to die on that cross. But guys, look here, the first day it's going to be bad. The second day it's going to be sad. The third day you can get glad because I'm going to rise on that third day. And, that, and he said that everywhere he went and everybody that would listen to it, he said that to them. And here will be, and you'll see in a moment, two disciples that have been waiting in Jerusalem for three days. And on the third day, for some unknown reason, to me, puzzling reason, I mean, hey, you've been here three days. You can't wait a few more minutes. I mean, it's been three days, and, and you remember the first day, bad, second day, sad, third day, glad. After third, you can't, you, you know, you don't want to re-up your room like one more night. You know, you don't, you don't want, you, you, re, you mean, you're really going to just leave right now, and, and they just leave, and, and they're walking, yeah, they check out of the motel, and man, they count it all a loss, and let's get out of here. We thought it would be good, but it evidently is not going to be what we thought it was, and Let's just go on back home where we belong. And so in Luke 24, you have the story of this pair of disciples. One of them is named for us, by the way. His name is Cleopas, Cleo, if you will. Um, the other one is not named. Kind of odd, you know. I think maybe the Holy Spirit did that, so you could probably put your name in there, you know, okay? Uh, yeah, yeah. You and Cleopas walking down the road to Emmaus, a seven-mile journey, by the way, and you'll see it in the first verse, seven miles from Jerusalem, where Jesus was crucified, to a little city outside of Jerusalem called Emmaus. And these guys are guys that had followed Christ. Uh, some uh, had, you know, I, I really never heard of Cleopas except in this story. So, I, I mean, he, he obviously had some belief and, 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 wanted, and was a believer because he was waiting for the three days and, and he was all fired up about it. Um, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So just kind of get this in your mind, I mean, as a picture, all right? Because really, everything that happens is really a picture of a lot of things in life about us and Christ and salvation and resurrection and hope and future and God's work, and it just says it all to us. Get the picture in your mind. Here you have two disciples that have turned their back. Jerusalem's here. This is where Jer Jesus said, all right, come stay here and, and, and go to this upper room. And then the Holy Spirit is going to come in there. And the Holy Spirit is going to give you power like you've never seen before so that you can be witnesses all over the world for me. Got it? Got it, Jesus. Upper room, Jerusalem, yeah. Three days, he, three, on the third day now. I mean, they haven't even given him the whole day yet. And now, and, and they have turned their back on Jerusalem and they are discouraged and they are walking away from God. And where are they going? They're going back home, which is where most people go when they walk away from God, back to familiar things, Right? Yeah, back to the old way of life, I mean, that's familiar to you because, I mean, after all, what else do you have, right? So they're walking back home and going back to, you know what they're going to do back there? They think they're going to their hometown to bury their hope because they watched their hope die on that cross with Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, their hope died on that cross. And so now they're sad and disappointed and disillusioned Man, I thought it was going to work, but evidently Jesus couldn't pull it off. And, and, and so let's just go on back to the house and just see we, what we can do for a living now and just kind of get over all it. And they're on their way back to bury their hope. And in the midst of that, uh, something miraculous happens. And they talk together as, uh, of all these things which had happened. So they're, they're conversing with each other, which, by the way... Uh, I don't know if you know this, but there, there are basically two, ty two types of people in the world. I'm, I'm just going to broad brush something real quick for you. There are believers and there are joiners. Believers and joiners. There are people that believe, and if you ask them, they will say, I believe, yes, yes, I, I believe, I believe. This whole community around this church right here is full of believers, full of believers. 
You go to any door, knock on the door, ask about Christ. Yeah, man, I believe in Jesus. Oh, yeah. Shoot, who would be? Man, you'd be foolish not to believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I mean, they're all kind of belief, but, but believers don't make you, it doesn't make you a joiner. And then there are joiners. There are people that actually link themselves with other believers and, and their life is different because now they are not alone hanging out here because uh, one little clue, uh, your belief will surely die and suddenly die. Your belief will die if you do not attach it to some belief that belongs to other people that are like-minded and like-spirited like you. Your belief will go away. And when your belief dies, your hope dies, and that's what happened to these guys. These guys have left the disciples They have left the Holy Spirit in the upper room, and they are now walking alongside each other as believers and not joiners, and they're talking to each other about how sad they are about what didn't happen in Jerusalem that day. And as they're talking to each other, they're not lifting each other's burden. They're not, they're not bringing any joy to the situation. They're not bringing any light to the subject as they walk along. And they're ta- look, as long as they are walking and talking to each other about Jesus, there's no light in them. And all of a sudden, while these guys are walking in the wrong direction, they are sad about the fact that Jesus couldn't pull it off. They have no faith. They have no hope left. And they want to bury their hope all of a sudden, Jesus himself chases them down and catches up with them on their road to Emmaus and joins them in their little walk back in the wrong direction. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, I just, you know, you can see it here that he didn't announce who he was. I mean, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't come in with pomp and circumstance and lightning bolts and Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, uh, Joe, said, Joe said he watched uh, the Ten Commandments again this weekend. Did any of you guys watch the Ten Commandments? It's on about 100 times over the weekend on every channel, I think. Cecil B. DeMille, yeah, you know, the Ten Commandments. Moses, the children of Israel. Uh, Edward, Edward G. Robinson's a little uh, a guy that's always stirring up contention. Uh, Charlton Heston is Moses. And you know the guys. Yul Brenner, the Pharaoh, you know, you know. I mean, y'all are sitting there. there. Come on, come on. And, 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 and in that movie, in that movie, every time God shows up, man, it's, it's, it, it is something else. It is, a, it is a spectacular show every time God shows up. Lightning flashes, thunder crashes, uh, uh, voice big deep, uh, moans. Out of, out, you know, out of the clouds. And 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 a, and, a, and a donkey's talk, and I mean, I mean, it's just like it's just like miraculous things, just like fireworks on Fourth of July, and it's a, it is you cannot miss the fact that God is on the scene. But here comes Jesus along, joins himself, just common little conversation, just common little situation, nothing miraculous seeming about this. He didn't come up there and say, "By the way, I'm Jesus. I'm the omniscient, omnipotent, ever-present Son of God." At your disposal. No, no. He just, he just comes up and walks up beside them. And look, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Which says to us something really important. And that is that when God works in your life, most of the time, you don't see it. When God does something in you... You don't know that it's God because you can't see God out of the windshield of your life, especially when it doesn't feel good, especially when it, you know, I mean, it's distressful, it's, it's anxiety producing, it's, it, it, you know, it's scary, it's fearful, or, and, 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 and it just makes you feel bad. I mean, it's really hard to see God in something that makes you feel bad. And you can't, I mean, to, to feel God's presence there when your heart is broken, whoo, man, it's hard to feel God's presence. And so quite often, 
When God is working in a situation, we don't even see him working. Our eyes are like their eyes, and they don't even recognize, man, that is Jesus just walked up and talking, walking down the road. They're talking about how sad they are. He, oh, we're going to miss Jesus. He was such a good man. He did such good things. No, oh, did you see him walk on the water? I can't believe that. And I cast those demons out of people. Man, what wild stuff can Jesus do? And what are we going to do without somebody that can put eyes back in and make deaf people hear? What what are we going to do with that? And Jesus just walking along saying, man, what y'all talking about? Uh-huh. What's up? Yeah, what's up, man? What's up? And, 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 so, and so it is only, it is only when, when some time has passed, when we've had a little time for our emotions to center and to gain some perspective about the things that are going on in our life that we can see God and his hand has been in it all along. It's like, God, I didn't even know it, and you have been in this thing all along. You were in that breakup, God. Hallelujah. Yeah, man, I cried my eyes out. I thought I would never get over that. But now look back, boy, look at what you've given me. This is way, way better than anything. I, what was I thinking back then? Bless God. That, was it. that financial crisis you had me in, God, man, that just knocked me to my knees. It knocked the breath out of me. I didn't didn't know what I was going to do. But you know, looking back at that thing, that made me get a, a little bit more understanding, a little bit more training than I got. Man, I'm making $10 an hour more than I would have ever made back then. I'd have been in that no end place all my life. Thank God you rescued me. Yeah. I didn't get the house. They said I could have it, but I could, and I didn't get the house. And you know, I thought that was going to be the end of my life because I just wanted that thing so bad. And you know, my wife just had surgery on her knee. And if we'd have got that house, it has an upstairs. She wouldn't have been able to go upstairs and, at, at all in the house. God knows what he's doing. That's all I, I'm saying to you. God does everything well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Often we don't see God out the windshield of our life. It takes you looking in the rearview mirror to see, a, a, to see God working. And they, their eyes are restrained that they can't see him. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that up there because that's going to come. I'm going to tell you everything in between those two verses real quick. They go. They continue to walk, talking to Jesus. Everything's good. Jesus is talking to them about what they're talking about. Hey, man, what you talking about? Simple conversation. Uh, simple uh, strategy. He, he walks all the way to Emmaus. They go all the way the seven miles. When they get to Emmaus, uh, Jesus uh, pretends like he's going to leave them. And, uh, and they say, wait, 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 don't go. And he said, well, okay, I guess I can stay a minute. And he sits down and through a miraculous something that happens there, which I'll show you in a little while, uh, they, their eyes are opened, and they recognize that it's Jesus. And as soon as they recognize that it's Jesus, immediately, verse 33, so they rose up that very hour. Everybody say, right then. Right then. As soon as they saw that that was Jesus, they, they, they returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered, saying, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how it was known, how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, peace be to you. Now, this is going to be a a, a good Easter sermon for you. Uh, As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure it's going to be a sermon. Everybody say, it's really not a sermon at all. (laughs) Really not a sermon at all. Okay. But it does have three points because, you know, on Easter, they taught us in school can you believe that there's a preaching school? Yeah. That there's school that they'll actually teach you how to preach a message in yeah. classes at school. Yeah. I didn't go to them, but uh, obviously <laughs> <laughs> I failed them miserably. Uh, <laughs> but they teach you like you know, especially on Easter, it's important to have a message with three points in it. So I got you three points. All right, number one, if you're taking notes. Now, I didn't write your own notes down because it's really not a sermon. Remember, I said that. Number one, if you're writing it down, is the return. So they're returning home. They're going home because they had hoped that everything would have worked out. And Jesus walks up, and he just asks them a question. uh, uh, What are you guys doing? Let me me get to it, verse verse 17. And And he said to them, what kind of conversation is that you have with one another as you walk and you're sad? 
Because they're just walking along and they're, and they're sad. They're obviously sad. Their, their countenance is downtrodden. Their face is down. I mean, what they're talking about, man, he said, you know, uh, what, you, what you guys talking about? And, 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 and he asked them this question. Well, I'm having a little trouble thinking about it for a moment, but because I'm thinking Jesus is the answer, right? I mean, he's the an- Jesus is the answer, right? Well, here is the answer asking a question. I'm thinking, okay, now, why would the answer need to ask a question? Well, and then, I, and, and, and then it kind of dawned just a second on me, and, it, and here's why I think. Why did, the question, why did the answer have to ask a question? Well, why does he have to ask us a question? You know why? Because he doesn't need information from us. He just needs to correct our question. Because most of the time, we're asking the wrong question to start with. And even if we're asking the right question, uh, we don't have the right perspective about it. We, in other words, Jesus asked us questions in order to clarify, what is it you really want? Uh, you pray, don't, I'm, I don't raise your hands because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. But how many in here pray, Lord, bless me. Lord, I just need your blessing. And he would say to you, what are you talking about? Because I don't think you know what you're talking about. Much less him. Because most of the time, when we're praying for a blessing, we're praying for something, right? I mean, Lord, I need a blessing. Money. Lord, I need a blessing. An automobile. Lord, I need a blessing. A job. Lord, I need a blessing. A wife, a husband. I mean, we're praying for a thing. A blessing is not a thing. A blessing is a state of your heart where you will be satisfied no matter what God gives you in life. That's, that's the blessing. And so Jesus said, now, are you sure? What is it that you want, you know? I mean, why are you sad? What is it you're talking about? Fill me in on some details as to what's happening on the inside of you so I can, you know, before, before I give you what you want, let's make sure what you want. Let's make sure that what you want is what you need. So I need to ask you a few questions about this so that you won't just be out there helter-skelter and when I answer you, you won't even know it because it doesn't even look anything like what you've been praying for. So he asked them a question. Hey, guys, what you, what, what, what's going on with you? And then, uh, then the one whose name was Cleopas, everybody say Cleo, He evidently was the leader of the group, Cleo, answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened in these days? Cleo says, man, who are, are you? Let me go on with the next thing. And he, and he, and Jesus said to him, what things? It just makes it worse. Are you a stranger around here? You don't know what's been happening in these last days. And Jesus looks at him and Jesus says, what days? I mean, what things? What things? And so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Man, uh, where have you been? Living under a rock? Well, actually, um, uh, under's not the right word. I would say maybe behind a rock for about three days. I've been back behind. And it's really not a rock. Technically, it would be a stone. No, Jesus, he said, concerning Jesus, who was a prophet before God, and how our chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified. Whew. All right, here's your Greek word. You ready for it? All right, everybody needs to learn it because you need to impress your friends, right? Okay. I don't want anybody disrespecting our church and calling us this little shopping center church like, like we're not real. You know, we're not deep. We don't have any... Okay, so here's your, here's, your, here's your Greek word, paradidomi. Can you say the word paradidomi? All right, everybody together. I'm just going to count you off. One, two, three, paradidomi. All right, let's do it again. One, two, three, paradidomi. All right, now you know a Greek word, right? The word means to hand it over. And it has another connotation that'll mean something a little later from now. It means hand it over for the appropriate time. The word paradidomy is a Greek word, and it means hand it over for an appointed time. In other words, there's a 
There's a future use of this. There's a future time of this. But right now, hand it over, buddy. And this is what happened to Jesus all the way through this whole trial, arrest, crucifixion and stuff. Judas parodidomy, Jesus, handed him over to the soldiers in the garden, right? Kissed him and they arrested him and that was Jesus. So Judas handed him over to the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers then took Jesus, still nighttime now, took him to the high priest's father-in-law. His name was Annas. Why he took him to the guy's father-in-law, I don't know, but he took him to, the, to Paul-in-law. So the soldiers, parodidomy to Annas, gave him up, handed him over. Then Annas handed him over to Caiaphas, the high priest. And Caiaphas had a, like a little mock trial, a little pretend trial, informal trial before sunup. All of these things done in the night, totally illegal. Look at your neighbor and say, totally illegal. Totally illegal. They must have some struggles like, well, never mind, I'm, I'm sorry. All right, totally illegal. And, and there you go, buddy. And, and, uh, and, and then the, the Sanhedrin hands him over to Pilate. And Pilate says, I can't find any fault in him. And he hands him to Herod. Because he hears that Jesus might have a little Galilean in him, and he's hoping that Herod, who rose Galilee, will kind of take him off his hands, you know. And, uh, Herod, here, and Herod said, hot dog, man, I've been waiting for Jesus. Woohoo! I've been hearing a lot of things about him. I tell you, I've been hearing about miracles. And I, I want that Jesus to pour, pour me a miracle. Dance a jig, pull a rabbit out of the hat. I mean, good night, boy. I'm going to have fun with Jesus. Cause I've been waiting to see him because I've been hearing about all these miracle things. To do. And, and, and Jesus and Herod starts talking to Jesus, and Jesus won't even talk to Herod. Jesus does not say one word to Herod. Herod then sends him back to Pilate and says, this guy's no fun. And then Pilate has to present Barabbas, hoping they'll choose Jesus, and the crowd goes crazy like crowds do, and, and they uh, call for Barabbas. So Pilate, Pilate, parodidomy, Pilate handed over Jesus. To the, to, the, to the scourgers, to the, the, to the guys with the cat of nine tails and the crown thorns and the cross and the nails and fire. Paradidomy hand me, handed him over. Well, so the chief priests and the rulers handed Jesus to be condemned unto death. Now notice what they say, the, the guys on the road. But we had hoped. But we had hoped that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And indeed, and besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. We had hoped. What does that say about their hope? Had hoped is what? A, a, a past tense verb, right? Yeah, had. It means it was in the past. It means it's over. It means... We, we thought it was going to work. We, we hoped it was going to work. When we entered this thing, we were so excited about this. We just said, man, are we looking forward to this. This is going to be the greatest thing in the world. And then he died. The end. The end. I had hoped that God would give me victory over this sin this time. I had hopes that God would break my chains and loosen my bonds from this addiction. I had prayed God would put my marriage back together and fix my home. I had hopes that I would be able to get a good job and, and, and have a nice life. I had, I had hoped if I was involved that, that Jesus would do great things in me and would heal my body. I, I, I had hoped that I could, I, I could pray like the Bible says for peace and God would give me peace like the Bible says I can have. I, I, can, I, I had hoped that I could have had all of these things, but now it's over with. Jesus is dead on a cross. And I'm leaving and I'm going back home where I know where I'm from. And you really can't blame them, really, can you? I mean, where else can you go? He died on the cross. 
Your hope died on a cross. Your faith got nailed to that cross with Jesus. Where, what else can you, what else can you do? Because you know life will hit you that hard, don't you? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You ever been hit that hard by life? I know everybody that's not shaking your head, you're asleep, wake up. Because <laughs> life will tear you up. Man, I can't believe how hard. Life will knock the wind out of you. You'll be going along there, man. Everything's going good. Everything looking good. It, may, man, it might be a little trouble. might be a little hard. But all of a sudden, boom, man, right in the solar plexus. Life just puts one on you, man. Knocks you to your knees. Woo. And then you, and, and when that happens, you go back to familiar things. You look for comfort food is what you look for. You know. Let me go back. I, you know, I had, I had given up this old bad deal over here, but I, I, man, now, 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 woo, I got, I got to get back. I got back, and, and, and you're just all beside yourself, and you're nervous, and you're anxious, and you, and, and, and you're getting back in stuff that you used to not be in, and stuff that's harmful and hurtful for you. you know, and I, because, because life has knocked the breath out of you. Yeah. And these guys walking back say, "Man, we had hoped. We really believed it." And we put all our eggs in that basket, and now, oh, no, he's, he's, he's gone. And like I said, the puzzling thing is, the puzzling thing, look. Indeed, besides all this, today, the day they're walking, is the third day since these things happened. I mean, they're not even letting sun go down. They're not even waiting until this afternoon to leave. So the first point in this sermon is the return. Second point in the sermon is the reveal. I know that doesn't make any sense to you unless you're a sneakerhead or a techno junkie. The reveal, when products are revealed to you, so to speak. Not when you can buy them, but when they're revealed to say they will be available one day. So the power of God, the resurrection reveals the power of God, but not like you think. Is that confusing enough? The resurrection reveals the power of God, but not like you think. I am used to preaching sermons on Easter and hearing sermons on Easter. And these sermons are about the power of God, which is appropriate because it, it, it takes power to rise from the dead, right? I mean, you have to be strong. Jesus is strong. Uh, the blood is a powerful uh, symbol and a powerful uh, part of the covenant with God. And so, you know, I'm used to hearing about the blood. I'm used to hearing about the power of God. I'm used to hearing about the strength of God, how strong God is. And I'm even, in, I'm even used to hearing about the sovereignty of God. There, there's a good church word for you. Sovereignty. It means kingship. Master, mastership. <laughs> Master. <laughs> it means you're the boss man. But there's one thing that I'm not sure that I've ever heard about Jesus, except about three years ago I said it here, and that is how sneaky Jesus is. Now, when I say sneaky Jesus, I don't want you to fall out of the chair. And some of you that have no problems with the concept of sneaky Jesus you're saying, what is wrong with that? Somebody has a problem with that? Well, some people think it's irreverent to call Jesus sneaky because it implies that he, you know, is a scoundrel of some kind or he, he slipshod. But I, 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 I use that term with endearment and, and, and only in the best manner and in the best way do I want to call Jesus sneaky, but I don't know what else to call him. He's sneaky Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. Let me just show you what I mean. Yeah. All right. He was born in a manger, not even a motel room. He was born in a manger in Bethlehem. Nobody knew where he was except a star came out and some shepherds heard some angels singing. 
and, and uh, there was a bunch of cattle and uh, sheep and oxen and all that, and, 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 and maybe a few shepherds that drug up there to watch Jesus be born. So Jesus, the king of the world and the universe, the God of everything, was born in the middle of the night in some backwoods dump called Bethlehem where nobody even knows where it is anymore. And, 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 and he's got a little crowd. He wasn't born to a big group of people in some big political capital of the world with all the power and the prestige of a great family. He snuck into this world. Sneaky Jesus. And then he grew up all of his life. And we don't have but about two verses about, in the Bible about what Jesus did while he was growing up. Nobody kept track of him. Nobody. This is the son of God walking around shooting marbles and, you know, uh, uh, you know, playing mumbly peg. Come on, stick ball with his brothers. Uh, no, nobody records anything about his his childhood except when he goes down to the temple to, to you know, to 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 meet the priest and, and you know, be uh, receive his manhood, bar mitzvah, blah blah. Sneaky. Whew. And his, the whole time he had those disciples, first of all, those disciples, now there's something to be looked at. Those guys were, they, well, let's just say they were not the best of the best. Let's just say it that way. They were fishermen and farmers and tax collectors and backwoods hoodlums and that, couldn't, that, that didn't have a rabbi, which means nobody wanted them. And Jesus just come by and said, hey, walk with me, walk with me. Uh, and, and then all the time they were with him, he was, just, he was just scaring them to death. He would be out in the middle, like, he was out in the middle of the Lake of Galilee, and, and uh, the, excuse me, the disciples out in the Lake of Galilee, boat just whoosh, wind, whoosh, waves, whoosh, tearing up. And, and then, and Jesus wasn't with them, but all of a sudden, they look, and coming across the water is Jesus. And they look out there and they say, it's a ghost, go, you know, and they start trying to hide in the boat. And he said, hey, God, settle down, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. And then, he, and then he, and he joins two guys on the road to Emmaus talking about how sad they are that he couldn't pull it off. And he walks seven miles with them and never tells them that he's Jesus. Sneaky Jesus. A few days from now, he's going to see his disciples out on the Sea of Galilee, and he's going to be standing on the shore, and he's going to yell out, hey, guys, have you caught anything? And they're going to say, no. And he said, well, cast the net on the other side of the boat, and you'll catch a bunch of them. And, 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 and someone someone say, man, that guy looks kind of vaguely familiar to me. Who is that? Uh, and they didn't even know it was Jesus until John said, that's Jesus. And then, whoo, boy, action picked up then. Sneaky Jesus. Oh, he, he, all of his disciples gather in an upper room to wait on the Holy Spirit like he's told them to. And what does he do with no fanfare, no announcement, nothing? He just walks through the wall and says, hey, guys, I'm here, man. Look, you want to feel something cool? Feel that right there. Hey, come on, put, look at that spear. Look, put that, you, you'll like that. Give me some fish, by the way. That just proved he wasn't a ghost because ghosts can't eat. So he ate some fish to prove he was real. He real flesh and blood, man. He wasn't some phantom. He's real Jesus. Well, that's what I'm talking about when I say that the resurrection reveals the power of God, but not like you think. You see... When, when these disciples, these two guys that are walking back to Emmaus, when they watched what happened on the cross, here's what they saw. They saw Jesus nailed to a cross and bleeding, and they heard him say, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, uh, today you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son, and son, behold your woman. I mean, behold your mama. Um, I thirst. Um, uh, it is finished. And Father, into your hands I command my spirit. And they saw him die. 
So when they looked at Jesus on the cross, what they saw was death. That cross meant for death. And here's what they missed, though. What they missed was that Jesus did not come to this world so that death would win. Jesus came to this world so that, that, that death would be dealt with and be overcome and that victory would be on this earth. That death would be defeated. Absolutely. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying to yourself, well, why didn't he just come out of heaven and just kill death? Or why didn't he come out of, devil, uh, come out of heaven and just drag the devil up by his pointy little tail and kick him all over the earth? Why didn't he do that? He could have done that. And then everybody would have said, hey, that's God. Uh, all right. Yeah, and that's what they would have said, and they would have been afraid of God, and they would have feared God, and they would have come to God because they were scared to death of God. They, they would have come to God because they knew they didn't have anything to lose. In other words, if God came through the front door, we would all want him for the wrong reason. He doesn't want us to want him because he might turn us into a crispy critter if, if we don't. He wants us to want him because we love him, because we cherish him, because we, we, we reverence him, we respect him, we want him. He's, we're passionate about him. And in order for us to have that opportunity, God had to kill death coming through the back door, so he had to dress victory up to look like death and drag it through the back door of the cross and hang it up there and let it die so that death could be defeated and victory could win. So I'm saying, the resurrection shows the power of God, and just not like you think. <laughs> he comes in through the back door, sneaky Jesus. Going to a cross. On the cross, Jesus says, and John, uh, uh, it is finished is the Greek word, tetelestai. J Jesus hanging on the cross, he says, tetelestai, which means it is finished. And the devil hears that, and the devil thinks, hot dog, whoo, he's finished. Mm. Boy, it's finally over with. I got him. You know, I thought it was really getting hard to get him, and I thought I might not ever get him. But he, he's finished. It's over with. That's because the devil doesn't understand code. <laughs> when he said it's finished, he meant it's just beginning. That, that, that's what he meant. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it's finished. The it was the devil. The it was death. That's what was finished. And Jesus came so that he might conquer death and give us victory in life. And he came through the back door because he had to defeat God. He had to defeat the enemy that way. And so as Jesus drew his last breath, I drew my first breath. Jesus' last breath on the cross was your first breath of life. And so, for the seven miles, they're talking and so forth. I'm just going to show you this, and I'm going to quit, okay? About 15 minutes from now. All right. <laughs> but but hang, hang with me now. You're going you're gonna to get, get to your ham and your Easter eggs and stuff, all right? Come on. The Easter Bunny's not going to take them back. All right. Then they drew near. The, I just want to show you sneak, how sneaky Jesus really is. Watch this. Watch this. They get, he gets to their village with them, all seven miles, and they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would go further. In other words, he said, hey, guys, man, I'd like to stay with you. Been good talking to you today. I got, I got to go. I'll get on, get on down the road. Wait, wait, Jesus, wait, 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 wait. Hey, stay with us, man, a minute. Man, you're so good to talk to. You got to, you know everything. And it's it just something. Boy, when you start talking to us, I, we, oh, it just makes me feel good on side. Man, come on, stay with us a minute. Come on, eat with us, Jesus. Oh, well, I really got to gotta get down the road. I, oh, come on, Jesus, come on. And, um, well, okay. And he goes back there, and they get supper ready. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, 
for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now, watch out for sneaky Jesus. Now, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread. He said, you got some bread? Hey, I'll tell you what. Let me serve you. Okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. He reaches out and he takes the bread. And he blesses it. Like, Father, we bless this food today for our bodies and, well, in my name, whatever he did. <laughs> I hadn't worked out all the details of this yet. <laughs> And he takes that bread. Now look, now watch sneaky Jesus now. See, they don't know who he is. They still don't know who he is. And he said, I'm going to reveal myself to them in a way that's going to be really surprising to them. And it's going to speak to them and speak to their need. And he grabs that bread, he blesses it, and then he broke it. And when he broke it, it reminded them of his body, which was broken on a cross. It reminded them of their hope that was broken. And then when he had their interest up and, and they had begun to think, this is something more than bread here. He reaches out and gave it to them. And when he reaches out and gives it to him, they see the nail holes in his wrist and they recognize that it's sneaky Jesus <laughs> revealing himself. What? Wow. I mean, it's, I mean, you can see it. Bing, bing, boop, bip. Ah! ah. It's Jesus, man. That's, that's Jesus. And then, and then when they saw that, they hurried back to Jerusalem just as fast as they could. Running, I mean, the whole seven miles back, seven miles one way, they were walking in darkness the whole way. Whole seven miles back, they got a whole different light on things, man. But Jesus is not dead. He's alive, man. They come running back. They tell the disciples, hey, Jesus, I saw Jesus, and he was on the road with us, and he broke the bread. Man, you won't believe what happened now. I mean, uh, settle down, man, settle down. Boy, he was fired up about it then. Now, there's one little, one little verse. Why, why would God have to do something like that. Now, just kind of hang on because this, this verse, this really will matter to you. I, 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 don't, get, don't get impatient for a second, would you? All right, this is one of the verses as Jesus was walking along talking to him, and it, it says, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, Jesus began to speak to them in all of the Bible, the things concerning himself. And so Jesus, while he's walking on the road with them, he just started saying, well, in Genesis, I, I'm the sacrificial lamb, and, Exodus, I'm the Passover lamb. And Leviticus, you know, I'm the law that was given for you. And Deuteronomy, I'm the great keeper and the number of man. You know, and he just went through every book of the Bible exposing himself to them out of their own books. And, and then Jesus said this to them. And it, this is something I want you to get now. Jesus said, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in his glory? In other words, what Jesus is saying is, look, in order to enter into glory, you got to suffer. Isn't that, am I misreading that? Isn't that what, it, I mean, it, doesn't he say, Jesus, it was proper, it was fitting, it was right, in order for Jesus to receive the glory that he's going to receive, that Jesus also had to receive first, before he received the glory, he had to receive the, the suffering and the sorrow. Glory never looks like glory when it's coming at you. Right? God sends glory on this earth, but it doesn't look like glory. It looks like pain. You know, God sends patience on this earth. Oh, it doesn't look like patience. It looks like a 16-year-old teenager that you'd like to put up for adoption. Uh, <laughs> You getting my point here? And you 
know, stuff, uh, the first time it happens to you, it, you know, a lot of times it's better in your memory, right? I mean, really, in your memory? You remember it better than it actually really was. I'm talking about family vacation here, by the way, in case you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, people say, oh, we had a wonderful family vacation. No, you didn't. Well, yeah, we got it. Uh, we look at all these pictures on Facebook. Uh, yeah, you edited every one of them. Man, look, don't look on Facebook and think any of that stuff's real. I mean, that's all, that is side A of somebody's life. All you p old people know what side A and side B means? Side A is the hit record, and side B is the junk they put on there to fill up the rest of it. <laughs> Facebook is side A. It's only what they want you to see, and they only want you to see the stuff that they're proud of. And, and, and so you look at it, and you're going, oh, my God, oh, my God. They're living a wonderful life, and what's happened to me? And then you go out and commit suicide. I mean, you know, the, the, the memories... I mean, you edited out that picture of where you left them at the Grand Canyon, but she made you go back and get them, right? <laughs> you said, they're big enough. They can take care of themselves. Why worry about them? <laughs> I'm sure somebody will be coming through the next two weeks going our way. So the memories of things and the, and the looking back of things can often be, it, it, I'm just saying that the glory that God puts in your life doesn't look like glory when it's coming. That's what I'm saying to you. That it only looks like glory when you look back at it and say, man, is that what God was doing? He's had his hands on it all the time. What was I thinking? Glory to God. Jesus had to suffer to receive more. It doesn't feel like glory when you're suffering, but it is. Until you can understand glory through the terms of sorrow, you'll never understand glory. And it was fitting that Jesus would suffer to enter into his glory. Now, let's get the, re get the reveal, I mean the release, and I'm going to quit, I'm, even though that's not the end of it. I'll do some more sometime, maybe next Easter. <laughs> All right. I'm going to tell you something that sneakerheads know and techies know, these uh, iPhone and smartphone people know that you probably don't know if you don't deal with this kind of stuff. There is, there is a... Re there is a reveal to a product, and then there's a release to a product. In other words, a lot of these new, new sneakers, Donovan is a, a sneakerhead. He's one of them. <laughs> I mean, every time a new sneaker comes out, he knows, he knows it. I mean, they're in catalogs, they're on the internet, there's something. You've never even heard of it before. You've never seen it before. He'll come back and go, look, Papa, look at this. What do you think about this? Does this look good? And he just lives in that world. Well... You, hey, you smartphone people are laughing, but you do the same thing. Steve Jobs, bless his heart, used to, Steve Jobs came out, and about three months before a new iPhone would come out, he'd come on TV and tell, you know, they'd have some conference or some internet conference, they'd be, they'd be touting all the new gadgets and gizmos and ups of this, uh, man, this iPhone uh, 10 is going to be, whoo, it's going to be, and they tell you everything about it, and you, but you can't go down to the store and buy one, because it's going to be three more months before they even got them made. They're just telling you in advance what to look for to try to get you pumped up about wanting one of them and to know what it's all about and how they look like. So you'll be standing at, at one of those 300 people at some door somewhere looking like some you know, clown waiting outside to buy a phone for $5,000. <laughs> when, when the one you got does everything that one did, except this one has a lens that'll make you look upside down. That's about it. <laughs> And so, so, so what I'm saying is, and I, you may be way ahead of me. I may, have, I may have, have said funny things and made you forget where we were, but the release and the reveal, the cross is the release. The cross says, God has saved your soul. God has washed you with the blood of the lamb. God has... God has done everything to take away your sin, to make it where you can go to heaven when you die. Jesus has taken all your pain, all your suffering, all your death. You don't pray for things that God hadn't had his bloody hands on, man, his hands. His bloody hands have been on every tragedy you ever had, every misery you ever had, every sickness you ever had, every disease, every death you've ever had. It has been the bloody hand of Jesus on that thing. I got this, I got this, I'm here. 
That is the release. Then there is the reveal. The resurrection is the reveal. The time between the reveal and the release is a big space. Now follow me. Don't, don't get real impatient. This space right here is where faith dies. This space between reveal, I'm going to answer that prayer for you, buddy. I got great things for you. Just hang on, boy. Get your faith up. Walk by faith. It's going to happen. And then actually getting a job that you prayed for. Reveal, the release, between there is a space. For the followers of Christ in this day, three days and three nights was the space. For us, it's that time between, uh, I thought God was going to, uh, I just knew God was going to. Wait, you said you'd never do it, but you did it. But God doesn't intend for your faith and your hope to die in this space. He intends for this space to be a space where your faith and hope can grow. It gives it room to grow, but you have to understand that God comes in the back door, not the front door. Let me, let me just give you this. I, I'm, I'm just rushing through. Uh, I taught you the Greek word, you remember? What, can anybody tell me what it was? Paradidomy. If I say it, paradidomy. Paradidomy, you know, means to hand it over. Hand it over, and at an appropriate time, it'll be, it'll be there. It'll be where it needs to be at an appropriate time. Now, Judas paradidomy, the soldiers, Judas the soldiers, soldiers, Annas, Annas, Caiaphas, Sanhedrin, Herod, Pilate, back to Pilate again, to the crowd, on the cross, paradidomy, hand it over, and he did. And then when Jesus was on the cross, I, this is what I didn't tell you a while ago, uh, it says that when Jesus cried with a loud voice, it is finished. And then he gave up his spirit. That's what the word gave up, the two words gave up. Those are the two words we use in the English language. But how many of you know the Bible wasn't written in English? And that this section that we're reading is, yes, it was written in Greek. And guess what word... Greek word Jesus used on the cross when he said to his father, I'm handing myself over to you. What word was it? Paradidomy. Sneaky preacher. He taught you a Greek word and didn't, you didn't know. You didn't know it was going to be a point, did you? You thought it was just something I was trying to you know, have fun with, right? When Jesus looked at his father, he said, Father, Paradidomy, I'm giving myself up. To you. In other words, Father, keep this safe until Sunday, would you? When Sunday, I'm going to need it again, but right now I don't need it, so I'm handing it over to you, and Sunday, uh, it, it'll be there for me. And so Jesus goes down, and Jesus looks at the devil, and Jesus says, Devil, what you got there? Now, the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 8, tells us the conclusion of this conversation. It does not tell us the entire conversation, but it does tell us the conclusion of the conversation. And it says that uh, when, when the conversation was over, that, uh, that Jesus, let me, let me turn over, yeah, Revelation 1, 8. Jesus said, I am he who was dead, and I'm alive evermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. So one day... Between the three days and three nights, Jesus goes to the devil. Jesus looks at the devil and Jesus says, uh, what you got there, devil? And he said, I got some keys. <laughs> really? What are the keys for? Well, this key right here is for death. And Jesus looked at him and said, paradidomy, hand it over, devil. I paid for that key just a few minutes ago. <laughs> hand it over. Well, it seemed like you got something else there, devil. What is that? He said, well, this is the key to hell. This is the key to judgment. This is the key that will send everybody who can't live by the law and can't follow the Ten Commandments right straight down here with me. And Jesus looked at him and said, ah, paradidomy. Hand it over, devil. Because I just dealt with that a few moments ago. And Jesus took the keys, and, 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 and the keys were handed over to Jesus so that the hands that bled for us 
to be the hands that determine our eternity. You know who's going to write the history of your life? Those hands that bled on the cross. That's who's going to write the history of your life. And what are they going to write about you? You know, you know the invitation thought to me today for you is uh, hand it over. That's all I'm hearing really in my mind right now. Hand it over. Hand it over. What could it be? What could it be? What could hand it over? Uh, hey, what is it that you have in your life that Jesus died for that you're still carrying around? How about that? How long are you going to carry it? I mean, he died for it. He went up Calvary's hill and died on the cross so that you could be free from it. How long are you going to keep carrying it around? Hand it over. All right, disappointment you got? How about hand that disappointment you got over? Or, or, or that fear, the fear that you're carrying around, you've been carrying around all your life? Hand it over. Or the shame or regret or defeat or excuse, I mean, hand it over that you might experience what Paul said when Paul said, well, I reckon. You know, that means Paul was a country preacher, right? <laughs> Paul said, I reckon. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in Christ if you'll hand it over. 